Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. Down my knees. Let's go before the Lord together in prayer today. Father, what a great day it is, Lord. We celebrate your goodness, God. We celebrate Jesus this day. God, we're grateful and we thank you for all the moms, God. We pray that you bless them. Lord, we know that this day can be a, a hard day for many. God, we thank you, Lord, that your comfort, your peace, your strength is ministered to them. And Lord, we just praise you and thank you for your goodness in our lives. Thank you, God. We wouldn't be here without a mom, God. Good, bad, or indifferent, Lord. We're grateful that we get to come into your house this day. Holy Spirit, as we open up your word, we pray that you come and be our teacher, be our guide. You're welcome in this place. Minister your wisdom, your will, and your ways to our hearts, God. We pray, Father God, that as we open up your word, you open it up to us and open us up to receive it. Give us eyes that see and ears that hear, hearts that have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. It may produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches that are both preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord, and we love them. No time do we think of ourselves any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. So God, we'd ask that you bless all of our brothers and sisters, bless the Baptists, the Lutherans, the Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. God, we thank you for Calvary Chapel Harvest, for Oak Valley, God, for the well and the way, for Ecclesia, God, and for Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist, God, too many to name. Lord, truly your church is great and diverse, God. And Lord, we bless the, uh, the Foursquare and Assemblies, God. We bless our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters, those that are naming Jesus as Lord. We bless them as you bless us this day. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say... Amen. And today, get your Bibles out and go with me to the wonderful book of Hebrews. We're in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, continuing our study of the book of Hebrews, line upon line, precept upon precept. You say, what does that mean? And that means you know, most of the, the Bible is written, uh, especially in the New Testament, written as letters, written as a, a written account, and there wasn't chapter and verse originally. There was just a, a complete thought. And so we believe that if God wrote it that way, we ought to be able to understand it that way. And that's why we go line upon line, precept upon precept, is so that we can build on our understanding. Today, as you're turning to Hebrews, the 10th chapter, I want to give you the title of the message. It's Establishing the Will of God. Establishing the Will of God. Now, this may not go in the direction that you think it's going to go today, but we're going to allow the Word of God to speak to our hearts from Hebrews, the 10th chapter, and see what's going on today. Hebrews, chapter 10, we're going to start in verse number 5 and read through verse number 10. Hebrews, chapter 10, verse number 5 starts out and says, Therefore, when he came into the world, speaking of Jesus, he said, Sacrifice an offering you did not desire. But a body you have prepared for me. Verse number six, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Verse number seven comes along, then I said, behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. Verse number eight, previously saying sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Verse number nine, then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. Verse number 10, by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Now, I want to remind you of some things out of the word of God. First of all, I want to remind you that Hebrews, the 10th chapter, comes after Hebrews, the 9th chapter. Why is that important for me to say? Because we have just come out of learning about the tabernacle, learning about the instruments of the, the tent of meeting there, learning about uh, the sacrificial system, the high priest. We, we've been learning about all the different significance of what's been taking place, the blood, the sacrifice, the images of Christ. See, last week we talked about coming out of the shadows, and coming into the reality of the substance. Now, the, the scriptures are starting to change our thinking. We're coming off of the shadow, off of the image, off of the old, and now we're coming on to the new. God is pointing us in a new direction and showing us not the shadow any longer, but now he's turning us to the real substance. Let's take a look at it again. Hebrews 10, chapter verse number 5. Therefore, when he, speaking of Jesus, came into the world... He said something. Now, it's almost as if God took the curtain of heaven and he kind of pulled it back for us to see what was taking place behind the scenes. See, God was waiting for a time to send Jesus into the world, born of a virgin, veiled in flesh. And therefore, Jesus, the eternal God, one with the Father in glory, there in heaven, there he speaks to God the Father and he says some things. He says, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body... You have prepared for me. See, Jesus said, you, you, you didn't really want this sacrifice. You didn't really want the offering. What you wanted is what's going to take place in me. Verse number six, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. 
Now, we wonder about that because we say, well, why would God set up the Levitical priesthood? Why would God set up the tabernacle? Why would God set up the whole law system if that was not his desire? Didn't God will to do that? Wasn't that the plan of God? Well, the answer is found in the book of Genesis. Because if you read in the book of Genesis, you'll find God's original intent. See, the way God set it up there is how God desired and how God had planned. Think about it for a second. Here's God. Here's the man. Here's the woman, right? And he sets them in the garden. He says, gives them a job. I want you to tend to the garden. I want you to be fruitful and multiply. Subdue and have dominion. Fill the earth, right? He gives them his commandments. They are to hear the wisdom and the will of God, and then they are to do what God says. They're not to have their own will, their own way of thinking, their own uh, judgments about what's good and of evil. They are to get that directly from God himself. Well, you know what happened. Here comes uh, the serpent. Eve is deceived. She gives to her husband who is with her. He willingly rebels. And now they have entered into sin. And now their eyes are open, the Bible says, and they discern for themselves, seeing what is both good and what is evil. Now they're making decisions for themselves. Now they're, they're saying, this is good, this is evil, this is right, this is wrong. And rather than hearing from the voice of God. See, that was not God's desire. That was not God's original intent for mankind. And yet, because here we are in this situation of sin, what did God do? God set up the sacrificial system in order to cover sins, yet that was not God's desire. So here's Jesus. Here's Jesus speaking to the Father. He says, this was not your desire. You have no pleasure in it. But look at this. Verse 7, then I said, behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. You know what that's saying? That's saying that the whole Old Testament, all of the scriptures are speaking of Jesus. We see that throughout the New Testament as well. But look at what the rest of the verse says, to do your will, oh God. Remember when Jesus was on the earth, what did he say? He said, I always do those things that please my Father. I can't speak of my own, but that which I hear, that is what I speak. Whatever I see the Father doing, those works are the things that I'm doing. See, Jesus did not rest on his own will and way. No, he saw what the Father was doing. He was attentive to the voice of the Father, and then he went and he did the instructions of God. God's will God's way submitted himself, even though he was robed in flesh, even though he shared in the human experience, even though he suffered in the flesh, now he comes and he does the will of God. How? Not on his own, but in the power of the Holy Spirit, listening to the voice of God and following the lead of God. See, that was God's desire. That was God's pleasure. Verse number eight, previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire nor had pleasure in them. God is not pleased with sacrifices and burnt offerings for sin. You say, well, why is that? It wasn't that bringing us back into a right relationship with God? Yes, it was. However, that only dealt with the sin issue. See, because where there is a sacrifice or a burnt offering for sin, that means that somebody had sin and that guilt and shame was now there. In other words, God is not taking pleasure in the sacrifice, God is taking pleasure when we obey. God's desire is that we follow his will and his way. It's the same thing you, you encounter in the word of God when Samuel comes. And here's Saul saying, I, I've, I've won, I've done everything God told me to do, and now I'm going to give the sacrifice. And what does Samuel say? Did God delight in burnt offerings rather than in obeying the voice of the Lord? See, God doesn't want us to enter into sin. God doesn't want us doing our will our way. God wants us to do his will his way. Are you listening today? He says, these sacrifices which are offered according to the law, the end of verse number eight, which are offered according to the law. See, God set up that law covenant. God set up that sacrificial system to point us to Jesus. And it was now under obligation that we had to do those things. In fact, when you get into the book of Isaiah, you'll find out that God says, I hate your sacrifices. They're, they're an abomination to me. Your new moons, your festivals, your Sabbaths, your feasts, I, I just can't stand them any longer. I wish you guys would just stop. Why? Because it wasn't out of the heart. It was out of a religious obligation. It was legalism and religion. And God says, that's not my desire. That's not what I want. Even though I set this up to point you to Jesus, you guys aren't getting it. I'd rather have you be obedient children. Verse number nine, then he said, behold, I've come to do your will, O God. See, that's the plan and the purpose of God is us to do the will of the Lord. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. What does that mean? takes away the first, meaning he takes away that law, he takes away that religion, he takes away that sacrifice for sin, that he may establish the second. What is the second? The second is obedience to the will of God. Here I am, here I've come, Lord. 
to do your will. He becomes a sacrifice. He takes away, fulfills the law, and abolishes the law in his flesh, in himself. Now fulfilling it. And now abolishing it, doing away with it. Now he takes away the first that he may establish what? The will of God. The will of God. What is that? That we would hear his voice and that we would follow him. Now look at verse number 10. Verse number 10 says this. By that will, we have been sanctified. In other words, we have been set apart. That's what sanctification means. It means that we are set apart for God's holy purpose. Set apart for service to Almighty God. Now we are exclusively His. And no longer do we make our own decisions about what's right and wrong, what's good and evil. Now we get our direction from God himself directly. Now we have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us, and we can listen for his voice, and we can follow him. See, we have been set apart. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Once you say yes to Jesus, once you give your heart and life to Jesus, once you have now crossed over, you're born again, now you can receive your direction, your wisdom, and your will from God now, no longer having to rest on your own understanding, no longer having to rest on your own ways. We, in our lives, can establish His will. You say, what, me? I can do what? I can establish His will? Yeah, you. That's the desire of God for your life, is that you would walk according to His ways. And so the question comes, how do we do that? Glad you asked. We're going to answer that question today. To establish his will, we must. We must do some things in our life. If we're going to establish the will of God, a couple of things that we must do in order to establish the will of God for our lives. You guys ready for this today? I'm glad that about five or six of you are. How about the rest of y'all? All right, you guys here today? You guys ready for this today? There we go. There we go. To establish his will, we must, number one, we must love his voice. Love his voice. See, if you're going to establish the will of God in your life, you've got to love his voice. Remember, Jesus said, here I am to do your will. You had no pleasure in these sacrifices, but God, here I am to do your will. You've got to love the Lord enough to say, God, I'm going to do what you say. What did Jesus say? If you love me, you will obey my commands. You've got to love the voice of God. You've got to so desire. I, I absolutely love my wife, and, you know, anytime I'm in the offices, I always hear her wherever she's at. I always know where she's at by just listening. She has a voice that carries so sweet and so wonderful, and I can always hear her. She's talking to people, chopping it up, laughing, having a good time, and I always know where she's at because I love her voice. I can pick her out of a crowd. I know where she's at, and I know what she's doing, and I just love hearing her voice. See, and I want to spend time with her. I want to look at her. I want to hug her. I want to kiss her. Why? Because I just love her. See, the same thing is with God. So you've got to develop your heart to respond, to leap when you hear the voice of the Lord. When you get into the Word of God, to, to just savor every word and to, to just love spending time with Him. When you come into church, God, I know I'm going to hear your voice, God, and I don't want to hear your voice, God. I, I want to, God, I really desire to come after the things of God. That's why the psalmist says, as the deer pants for springs of living water, so my soul pants and thirsts after you. See, so we've got to develop that love for the voice of God. Kind of neat, when I was reading in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, the, the author of Hebrews is quoting from the Psalms, Psalms chapter 40. Put it up on the overheads for you, verse number 6. And it says, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, my ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Now, some of you might be going, wait a second. That's a little different than what the book of Hebrews just said. In Hebrews it said, but a body you prepared for me. But now here in the Psalms, it says something different. Is the Bible contradicting itself? Well, no, it's not. Remember that in the book of Hebrews, the curtain is drawn back, and we find out this is a messianic prophecy. And here is Jesus who was perfect. Here's Jesus who had the God nature. Here's Jesus who was all God and all man. Jesus would not be saying, my ears you have opened. But a man, remember, God used man to write the scriptures. And therefore, the psalmist writing, he's prophesying that there is a Messiah coming. But he says, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. But my ears, you've opened now. And, and, and maybe some of your newer translations, some of you guys have one of the newer translations. It kind of carries a connotation or the idea that, you know, God is making us listen by opening our ears. You know, when I read through that, I thought, oh, that's kind of weird. So I, I dug a little deeper and I, I looked it up. And really, it's not that God is making you listen. God's not going to force you into obedience. Really what it is, it, 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 the, the word, the original word is the same word used for digging. You find the same word, you know, when Isaac's servants went and they dug a well or they opened up 
a source of water, right? They opened up, they, they brought all the dirt out, and now they have dug down deep, and they have discovered the source of water. See, the same thing, some of us need to get our spiritual Q-tips out, and, and we need to do a little bit of digging in order to hear the voice of God. We need to open up our ears to hear what God would have us to say. See, God wants us to respond to him. God wants us to listen to him. We need to open our ears to hear God's voice. Since it's Mother's Day, I got a couple Mother's Day examples for you throughout the message. Is that okay for you all today? All right, good, because I was going to say it anyways, even if you didn't like it. But anyways, my my wife and I, when we had our children, uh, every time she was pregnant, I would speak to the babies, you know, when they were still in her belly. And I would go and I'd get them. I I tell you, my daughter, I got her all riled up when she was in the womb. It was like I would get her going and she'd be jumping and leaping and all this and that, you know, the belly's flying this way, then that way, because she's just getting crazy in there. Remember one night I got her all wound up right before bed and then the next day Jess is all tired and she's going, honey, can you not do that right before bed? She was up for hours after that, just keeping me awake, and I couldn't sleep because I was playing ping pong in the bed, you know, and so I said, okay, you know, and so we tried to do that a little bit earlier, but when they came out, when all the babies came out, they always knew our voice because we were constantly talking to them, singing to them, speaking to them, praying over them, and I remember one time we were here in the offices, my wife had brought our, our son, our middle, middle child, and, and he was there, and he has these, these deep brown eyes, and they just sparkle in the light, and, and a real handsome little guy. He's cute as a button when he was a baby, you know, kind of had those chubby cheeks, and, and you just loved him. She had him all swaddled, you know, all wrapped up tight, you know, that, that whole baby burrito type thing, and so here she is, she's holding him, and there's a group of ladies just surrounding my wife, and they are just pining over the little guy, right? Oh! my goodness, he's so cute. Look at those eyes. Oh, look at those cheeks, you know, and this and that. And there's all these voices all around. Everybody's talking at the same time. I don't know if anybody's listening. Somehow they're all catching it, you know, and they're all talking and it's this, this hum, this buzz of the ladies all around the baby. And I walked up and I just went, hey, buddy. And my son just went, Shh, right to me. Now everybody stopped and they all went, oh, did you see that? He knows the voice of his daddy. Well, of course he does. I've been talking to him for the past nine months, and he knows who I am. I'm dad. See, in the same way, there's many voices that are coming at us every day. There's the media that's coming, the news is telling us about stuff. There's the education systems and the society and the economics and, and all sorts of stuff. Our friends, our family, our relatives, our neighbors, all saying stuff. The flesh is rising up and telling us, I'm hungry and I want and I need and you got to listen to me and you got to feed me, right? And so all these voices are coming up. And in addition to that, the devil's trying to throw things at us, trying to put thoughts in our head. And yet, we need to love God's voice so much that in the midst of all this chaos of all these voices when God speaks we know right where he's at go right to him kind of neat in the word God gives us examples in the Old Testament of things turn to the book of Exodus kind of a fun example in the book of Exodus chapter number 21 Exodus chapter 21 one of those sections of scripture that if you read it at surface level you might kind of go oh that's weird you know it's a little interesting but you know I don't know what's going on there Book of Exodus, various laws are being given. And here they're talking about people who are slaves. Now, there were times in the nation of Israel when somebody had a debt that they owed that they couldn't pay. The Bible records that if they couldn't pay their debt, what they could do is they could join themselves to the person who they owed the debt to as a slave. And they could work off their debt. Now, in the year of Jubilee, every 50 years, all of the debts would be released and therefore that slave could go free. But you think about it, 50 years is a long time. So, you know, if you started at year 49, you had a long way to go before you were free. But sometimes, you know, 5, 10, 20 years in, you know, they would, they would be there, and then the year of Jubilee would come. Now, think about it for a second. These are people, these, these are not just slaves. This isn't an oppressive, you know, nation coming in and enslaving someone else. These are, these are brothers. These are kinsmen, right? This is people of their own nation. And so this person joins themselves to a master, making themselves a slave in order to work off a debt. Now, during that time, the master's probably looking at that person, and and they're not treating them bad. They're not punishing them or, you know, beating them or anything like that. They're, They're working off a debt. And during that time, think about it this way. You know, maybe it was a young man that owed a debt and he couldn't pay it, so he joins himself to the master. The master got this young man in his house, and, you know, the master might might be wanting to play matchmaker or something like that. So what does he do? He says, hey, you know what? You're a strapping young man, good looking. You know, I know somebody, and he's got a daughter, and and I just happen to have a couple camels that I could trade over here, and and maybe we could make a a deal over it. So he goes and and, and, and he gets his his slave in his house, a wife. And and so now they get married, and they, they, they 
they live in life. He's working off his debt. They start having children. And then the year of Jubilee comes. And this slave is looking at his life, looking around, and he goes, I've got it pretty good here. I actually like my occupation. I like what I'm doing. I, I like what's going on here. This is where we pick it up. Exodus, the ch 21st chapter, verse number 5 and verse number 6. Look at it with me. It says, but if the servant plainly says, I love my master. Everybody say, I love my master. Oh, say it with some intensity in your voice. I love my master. There you go. But if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Verse number six, then his master shall bring him to the judges, or some translations say before God. He shall also bring him to the door or to the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. So no, now, no longer is it because of the law stating that if you can't owe your debt, you can join yourself to this person as a slave. It's not about the law any longer. Now it's about love. I love my master. I love my wife. I love my children. I love what's going on here. I want to stay in this position. Now it's no longer a labor of the law. Now it is a labor of love. Wasn't that Jesus? Wasn't Jesus coming to be a servant out of love? God is love, the Bible tells us. And so Jesus wouldn't have any other nature in him than love. So Jesus was not a slave according to the law. No, he fulfilled the law. Jesus was a slave according to love. He willfully submitted himself while he was here on the earth. And now he serves us from heaven, interceding for us at the right hand of God. But guess what? There's nothing that you see in Jesus that you shouldn't see in us. Right? We are the body of Christ. The Bible says, but a body you have prepared for me. So we are the body of Christ. So this body should be prepared to be like Jesus. I should have had some amens on that. That's okay. You'll have more opportunities later. See, but we are now, just as Jesus was, love slaves to God. It's no longer out of law that we serve the Lord. No, the law has been abolished and fulfilled in Jesus. Now we serve God, not out of an obligation, not out of a debt that we owe, but because we love the Lord and because we want to serve him. Because we look around our life and say, I love my master. And I want to do what he says. Prepared to do his will. John chapter 10, verse 27. I'll put it up on the overheads for you. It says, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. See, that's what this is all about. We've got to love his voice so that we can hear him, know his voice, and follow him. So if we're going to establish the will of God, first thing for today is love his voice. Second thing for today, second thing, in order to establish the will of God in our lives, we need to, number two, obey even if it hurts. Obey even if it hurts. Remember, to be a love slave, there was pain involved. Because you don't pierce your ear with an awl without experiencing some pain. Is that right? Especially going up against the doorpost. I, I imagine, you know, a guy just leaning back, and here he is, and right up to the doorpost. And so there, were, there had to be that digging that took place, that, that opening. My ears you have opened, right? There was a piercing that took place. So there was pain involved in order to be a love slave. In the same way, sometimes as, as Christians in the American church, we, we think that because we joined up with Jesus and because God's given us his spirit, that everything's going to be easy in life, that it's going to be easy street, my bed is going to be a bed of roses, things are just going to come naturally to me, all this stuff's just going to fall into place, God's ordained every step, and therefore God's probably got me walking the streets of gold all the way to heaven. Listen, can I give you some reality for a second? Can, can we have a reality check in this place? If we're following Jesus and following his steps, when I take a look at the life of Jesus, Jesus' life was not easy street. The road that he walked was a road to Calvary, and that was a road that was marked with sufferings, a road that was marked with pain, a road that was marked with, with rejection, a road that was marked with anguish, a road that was marked with tears and weeping. You can read in the Bible that Jesus wept, that Jesus was hungry, that Jesus suffered, that Jesus had anguish, Jesus sweat, Jesus bled, Jesus felt pain, Jesus was beaten, Jesus was mocked, Jesus was scorched. And we think we're going to follow Jesus and not go through some trials? Listen, we got to get a reality check and realize that the road that we walk is marked with suffering. In fact, the Apostle Paul told the Ephesian church that we must enter the kingdom of God through many trials. And so we start bawling and squalling when things happen, and yet God is saying, it's okay. You know what? You're going to go through hard times. You're going to go through pain. You're going to go through trials, but obey anyways. Why? Because think about it. The seed that you sow, it, it, it may be sown with tears, but the Bible says you will reap with joy. Sorrow may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. See, there's good things ahead of you. You may not know them right now. 
But don't let the problem, don't let the pain, don't let the process get you off track because on the other side, there's a promise, there's a solution, there's a great thing God is going to do in your life. There is a blessing for obedience. See, sometimes your obedience will even be offensive to some. And in fact, it should be. That's the way it's designed. You know, when you start to obey the will of God, there's going to be people that get mad at you. Devil's going to get mad that you're obeying. People around you are going to get mad. Your relatives may start getting mad. Well, why are you giving your money to that church? What do you mean you go three times a week? Do you have any time for your family? What do you mean you're taking your kids and putting them in the children? What is that all about, you know? And they're going to start rising up and getting mad. But you are walking not to please man, but now you're walking to please God, and you may have to go through some persecutions. Another mother, I want to give a little Mother's Day illustration once again. Uh, my wife met a, a neat lady. She recently did a, a women's gathering meeting sort of thing. And, and uh, so there at the meeting, there was a lady that was in charge of it that had set it all up. And just a neat lady. And, and she had told her testimony at this little gathering that they had. And she was talking about how she was in Chicago. And she was, uh, through some circumstances, a single mom of two sons, okay, raising them by herself. And there she was just, uh, you know, living life and going to church and that sort of thing. And she desired to be married. Even though she was a single mom, she still wanted to be married. But she had purposed in her heart that she was going to obey the will of God and stay pure before God and, and not have any sort of sexual relationship before she got married. So she was going to abstain and be sexually pure before marriage. So throughout that time, for 16 years, she was celibate and kept herself from marriage. Now, in that time, she would still date. She'd still go out, you know, and meet a guy at church and start to date, go out and start talking this and that. And after a little while, she said the guy would, you know, say, hey, what about going back to my place? And she said, um, I'm sorry, no, I'm saving myself for marriage. And she experienced persecution from those men who called themselves Christians for staying celibate. Now, we say that shouldn't be, and yet that's the state of some people. Not all, okay? I'm not saying that all people, and you don't have to look at your neighbor with those weird eyes right now, okay, if you're single. Not everybody's like that. But she experienced persecution. In fact, even from some of the ladies, they were like, what's the big deal? Go for it. You can, you know, you got needs, girl. Go ahead. And she's like, I need to follow the will of God, you know. And so she stayed celibate 16 years when she finally did meet the man of God. On her wedding day, both of her sons gave a speech, and they both said, Mom, we so appreciate God. Mom, we've been watching. Mom, we want to be just like you. And Mom, we want to marry women that are just like you. We want to save ourselves from marriage. Isn't that awesome? Your obedience will offend some. Acts chapter 5, let's take a look at it. The apostles here are in Jerusalem. Uh, the Holy Spirit's been poured out. They've been witnessing, going out, doing great and mighty works. On the, on the hour of prayer, Peter and John are walking into the temple, and they see a man begging alms. And so what do they do? Silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk, right? They pick him up there. This guy starts leaping. He starts running. He starts walking. I believe he danced the little Pentecostal jig, right? And so now all of a sudden he's spinning and twirling and jumping around. And, and there's a big stir that's created. Well, the religious leaders, they don't like big stirs that aren't about them. So what do they do? They grab up the apostles and they bring them in and they interrogate them. And they say, what did you do? Why are you doing this? What's this name of Jesus? And they tell them, you cannot teach in the name of Jesus anymore. And so the apostles go out and they are rejoicing that they're suffering for the name of Jesus. Now, if that was us, we probably would have called our lawyer and said, I know my rights. We need to sue the pants off these guys, you know, but they didn't do that. They were like, you know what? We're excited. Guess what happened? They go and they report back to all of the disciples. They say, we got to suffer for the name of Jesus. Isn't that awesome? So they're all excited. They go back and they're teaching in the name of Jesus. Well, the, the religious leaders hear about it again. So they gather them back up and they, and they, they put them into prison. Put them in jail. There they are overnight. Now in the middle of the night, an angel comes and says, what are you guys doing here in jail? You guys shouldn't be here. You guys need to be going and speaking the words of life to all the people. So the angel lets them out. And in the morning, the council comes back together, right? And they're all ready. And they say, okay, guards, bring them in. And so they call for them. And so the guards go down there to, to, the, to the jail cell. And, and they see that the guards are posted. The doors are locked. But ain't no... Ain't no disciples of Jesus in there. No, nobody's in there. What's going on? So scratching their head, they come back to the council and they say, um, we, we found the guards. The door was locked, but nobody was home. No, no one was inside the jail cell. We don't know where the, these guys went. And so they're looking around and all of a sudden the guy says, wait, are you looking for the guys that are out there in the temple courts preaching? 
And they said, yeah, those are the ones, bring them in, right? So they bring them in once again. And this is what happens, Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 5, verse number 27. It says, and when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. Verse 29, oh, I just love this. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Now, we take a look at that and we say, amen. You know, the high priest, if he was a godly man, we would have thought he would have said, well, you know what? You're right. You're right. I apologize. You should be obeying God. You should be obedient to the voice of the Lord. If that's what God told you to do, well, then I'm going to give it back to God. And if it's him, it's him. If it's not, then he'll take care of it. You know, he'll take care of you. That's what we would have thought. Take a look at what actually happens because of their obedience. Verse number 33, drop down to verse number 33. When they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. These are the religious leaders of the day. They should have been saying amen. They should have said, yes, we want to obey God too. But rather, what do they do? They persecute for their obedience. See, sometimes we need to obey even if it hurts. We need to obey even if it costs. We need to obey even if it's difficult. We need to obey even if it's hard and we don't see the end and we don't know how it's going to work out. We need to obey. Now, listen, we could stop right there and we could all go out of here kind of sad because we don't like suffering, we don't like pain. But listen, God has not left you orphans. He hasn't left you in this alone. God always will give you more than you can handle, but never more than you can bear. Do you hear what I just said? God always gives you more than you can handle. See, we can't do this in our own strength. This is more than we can handle. I can't save myself. I I can't fulfill the entire will of God for my life in my own strength. God always gives us more than we can handle, but never more than we can bear. Why? Because God is in there with you. God's in the fight with you. God will give you the power. God will give you the strength. That brings us to number three today. If we're going to establish the will of God in our lives, not only should we love his voice, not only should we obey even if it hurts, but thirdly for today, last one, is that we need to obey in the power God gives. God will give you the power to be obedient. God would never ask us to do something and not give us the power to do it. Even if it's big, even if it's lofty, even if we think, God, I can't handle that. God says, I know you can't handle that. But guess what? By my grace, I can handle it. That's why the Apostle Paul said, his grace is sufficient for me. And when I am weak, then I am strong. Why? Because the power of God rests on me. Now God comes in, your natural with God's super on it becomes a supernatural experience, and God gets the job done on your behalf. In fact, that's the definition of God's grace. God's grace, what is that? It's God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. Grace, God's power in me to do what his truth demands of me. So grace is the power of God to do his will. God has not left us alone in this. Now, I I have to say something. I wish I didn't have to say it, but I need to say it. And that is that grace is not an excuse for sin. In other words, there's many people today teaching false doctrine that says that, oh, yeah, I agree with that, Pastor. You know, God's power is going to do it. So you just live your life however you want to live. You want to do this or that. You want to go out there. And if you sin, don't worry about it. Grace will make up the difference for it. You know, grace, God's power, he'll, he'll fulfill the will somehow by grace. That is not the will of God for your life. That is not because how holy is holy. See, and if that's the case, then why would God command me to love people? Why would God command me to to speak words of edification that build people up rather than tear them down? Why would God command me not to go into sexual impurity and immorality? Why would God command me? All in the New Testament, all in letters written to churches, believers. Why would God tell believers to repent if we didn't ever need to repent? See, God's not a fool. God's not mixing words. God knows exactly what he's saying, and he's saying, I will give you the power to overcome, but it's not an excuse for your sin. See, in the book of Jude, I'll just put it up on the overheads for you. Jude chapter 1, verse 4, it says, For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Let me tell you, these are ungodly people. These are people who are not saved. How do I know that? Because there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So ungodly men, look at this, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. 
So somebody comes along to you and says, hey, don't worry about it. Go ahead. Have fun. Do your thing. You got needs, right? They are turning the grace of God into lewdness. The Bible says that's ungodly. That is not the will and the plan of God. See, even though your obedience will offend, your freedom should not offend. Even though your obedience will offend, your freedom should not offend. You say, what do you mean by that? See, I have the freedom in Christ. I could take a drink. Sure. I could smoke. Sure. I, I could go watch that movie, even though its rating is, you know, I, I see the content, nudity and profanity and, you know, gore and violence and all that. I, I could go watch it. I have the freedom in Christ to do that. And yet I'm not going to do that. Why? Because I love the Lord. And because I'm going to obey even when it hurts. And because God gives me the power to overcome, why would I want to fill myself with that stuff? See, I can listen to that music. You know, oh, I'm just listening to beats, Pastor. Sure. Yeah. Let me sing a couple bars of it and see if you can complete the song, right? It's in you. It's in you. You know the lyrics, and those things get on the inside of you and roll around in your spirit and your soul, and now you've seared your conscience, and you're going the wrong way. You need to repent and turn back to God. See, God says, listen, if you mess up, if you're going the wrong way, repent. What does it mean? Change your heart and mind and turn. Turn from the way that you were going and turn back God's way and go back God's way. Put it under the blood of Jesus and now, by the grace of God, start to change. Listen, it may take time. You might fall along the road, but dust yourself off. Get back up. Put it under the blood. Confess it to the Lord. Be forgiven. Be cleansed and walk in the grace of God. See, the Apostle Paul said, everything is permissible for me. I, I could do that. I could go there. I could see that. I could listen to that. He says, but not everything is profitable. And in fact, the Apostle Paul went so far as to say, if my eating meat causes someone else to stumble, I will never eat meat again. See, your, your obedience will offend, but your freedom should not. And grace is not a substitute for obedience, but rather grace is the power for obedience. Are you listening today? Let me say that again. Grace is not a substitute for obedience, but rather the power for obedience. See, when you mess up and you trip up and you say, I wonder if God even loves me. I wonder if God even cares. I wonder if I'm saved. Listen, God says you are if you have Christ. If you're going forward with God, get up, confess it, put it under the blood. You're forgiven. You're cleansed. And now receive the grace, the power of God. Now move forward in obedience. Walk. Do what it takes. Cut off those ungodly things. Get those things out of your life now and follow my ways because it's not going to be easy. It'll be tough. But guess what? I'll give you the power to do it in your life. Last verse for today. Last verse for today. Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Hebrews chapter 12. Great verse in Hebrews chapter 12. Verse number 28. We'll close with this today. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 28 says this. It says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Don't you just love that? It's an unshakable kingdom. Look at what it says. Let us have grace. It's your choice. It's your call. You can either say, yeah, I'm going to receive the grace of God, or you can say, no, nah, grace will cover it. No, let us receive grace for what? By which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. See, there is a grace of God to empower you to live a godly life, to walk in obedience to God's will and to God's way. What did we learn today about establishing the will of God? Number one, we learned that we need to love his voice, we need to listen for his voice so that it, uh, even in the, the drowning noise of all the other voices, that when God speaks, we can turn and go his way. We learned that we need to obey even if it hurts, even if it costs us something, even if it's painful, we still need to obey. And finally, we learn, obey in the power God gives. We can't do this ourselves. We need to do it in the power of God. If you got something from the word of the Lord today, come on, give God a great big praise. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. Hey, want to take a moment, quick moment. You guys have been great today. But there's some of you in this room that have not yet given God all of your heart, and you have not yet given God all of your life. And if you were to die today, can I tell you the truth? You wouldn't make it. You say, what does that mean? See, when we die, we're going to go one of two places. Either going to end up in heaven or end up in hell. Now, some people don't like the reality of hell, but just by denying its existence doesn't make it go away. You're going to have to deal with the fact that the Bible talks about hell, Old and New Testament. In fact, Jesus himself spoke of hell. It's a very real place. And I want to make sure that you don't end up there. Because it was never intended for you and I. It was intended for the devil and his angels. And not all roads lead to heaven. That's like saying all roads lead to the moon. Listen, you can drive around the earth as long as you want, and you will never make it to the moon. In the same way, you can't just do your thing or my thing or some well-meaning church committee's thing. 
stay true to ourselves and think that that's going to get us into heaven. It doesn't work like that. Many times people think, well, I've been good or I've been raised in church, pastor. My parents told me we were Christians growing up. Born in America, America's a Christian nation. I got involved in my last church. I sang in the choir and, and taught in the Bible classes. Doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian? But did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say your good works get you into heaven? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you're raised in church. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you get involved in church that you get to go to heaven. Because, see, our good works compared to God's goodness is like filthy rags. You're not going to get to stay. The Bible tells us all of sin and falls short of the glory of God. Not going to get there on our own merit. Not going to get there on our own goodness. Nor in the Bible say America is the Christian nation or that because you're not some other religion that you get to go to heaven just because of default and God loves you into that category. Come on today, examine your heart. Where are you at with God? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Sometimes people think, but I know God. I mean, I could quote scriptures. I celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of my life. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible is to say that because you know who God is? Listen, everybody in America knows who God is. Everybody knows about the baby in the manger at Christmas. Everybody knows about the resurrection at Easter, the cross on Good Friday. They know about that stuff, and yet, not everybody's going to get to go to heaven. You're going to go one of two places, heaven or hell. And just knowing who God is doesn't make the difference. You say, but I don't understand that. Well, if you've read your Bible, you would know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. The devil himself knows who Jesus is and believes that he's the Son of God. And yet, that's not going to get him into heaven. See, Jesus said, you must be born again. Now, many times we turn off because we've seen that in Hollywood or read about it in a book or, you know, read about it on the Internet. Listen, this is not about what society says or media or television or books or movies or the Internet about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean from the Bible? Because you, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. No other way you're going to get there. You must be born again. What does that mean? Well, it's always meant the same thing. It means you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. And if you haven't yet done that, I love you enough to tell you the truth, you're not going to make it. But today, I want to change destinies with you. You can choose today to say, I want to give God all my heart and want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. And this is all or nothing with Jesus. Because in the book of Revelation, Jesus said, I, when I come, I want to find you hot or cold because if I find the lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. See, we can't just be a little in and out, a little up and down, a little token prayer every now and again, a little church attendance. God is something in your life, but not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, that's not going to make it. Because those type of people are going to get ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. Listen, people that are vomited from the mouth of Jesus are not real Christians. So I want to give you this opportunity today. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. So in a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three, bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. But it's your call today, your choice. You can get right with God, acknowledging your need for Jesus, raising your hand, or you can sit there and do nothing when you know you need to do this. Your call. I've done my job. I've loved you enough to tell you the truth. God's done his job sending Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. Now it's your turn. Will you give him all of your heart, all of your life? All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television, in the foyer, or the Love Rock Cafe, this is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Today, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, given them all of your heart and all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm and you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it? Come on. This is your time. Count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. Here we go. All together on the count of three. If that's you, you need to do this. Get ready to get your hand up. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five. Thank you. Six, seven up top. Thank you. Eight on this side. Nine, ten up top. Gotcha. Ten wise people already. Anybody else real quick? Ten on this side. Anybody else? Give me a little wave if I don't see you. Anybody else? Ten, eleven. Thank you. Up top there. Eleven. I got you. Thank you. Right here. Eleven. Got you. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else real quick, if that's you, you know you need to do this. I'm going to just give you a couple more minutes, and then I'm going to close this down. Thank you, 12. Got you up there. God bless you. Who else today? Anybody else real quick? Anybody else real quick? All right, well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 12 wise people. All right. All 12 of you, real quick, get your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church. Get a friend if you need a friend. And in a moment, we're going to stand and give you a clap and a shout, sing a song as we do that. That's your cue. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. We're going to change destinies today. Can't do that till we get you down here. So if they, you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, it's not too late. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. You come right now. Let's all stand and welcome them. You come. Come on, come on, come on. Whoever you are, wherever you are.
where you've been. And it doesn't They're coming, let's give him a hand. Him. This is love. Turn around and come on. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, there is room for everyone. The foyer. This you can come into the church service. The time is now. You're there at the Love Rock. Come on Tell it usher. Whoever you come on, come on, come on. If that's you, even if you didn't you raise your hand, you can come too. And it doesn't matter to him. They're still coming. This Let's give them a hand. Come on, come on, come on. So turn around and come on home. Anybody else, if you need to come, you just come right now. Make your way to the whoever front. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, there is room for everyone. Hey, you guys. Thank God you guys have come. This Mother's Day weekend, you came to give God all of your heart, came to give God all of your life. Best decision of your life right there. I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine. This is Pastor Joel right over here waving at you. Pastor Joel's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. I'm going to let you know what he's going to do in advance so you're not wondering what's happening, okay? He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart, give you some free information, some free literature to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Then he'll introduce you to a program that we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Basically a friend in church who will help you get strong in the ways of the Lord. He'll let you know about that and then he'll let you come right back out, okay? So now listen, listen. Came to give God all your heart, give God all of your life. Let me ask something of you, okay? Would you give us a year here at The Rock, sitting consistently under the Word of God, sitting under the teaching of the Word of God consistently? At the end of that year, I guarantee you'll look at your life and you'll say, man, I'm so blessed. And for the rest of your life, you will be so blessed. You'll say, I never knew it could be like this. Am I telling the truth, everyone? All right, so if you guys make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.